mercy and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. We have come to know and believed in the great love with which God has loved us. The great love with which God has loved us is summarized concisely in the meanings to the first and second articles of the Apostles' Creed. The meaning to the first article goes like this. I believe that God has made me and all creatures, that he has given me my body and soul, eyes, ears, and all my members, my reason and all my senses, and still takes care of them. He also gives me clothing and shoes, food and drink, house and home, wife and children, land and animals, and all I have. He richly and daily provides me with all that I need to support this body and life. He defends me against all danger, guards, and protects me from all evil. All this he does, only out of fatherly, divine goodness and mercy, without any merit or worthiness in me. For all this, it is my duty to thank and praise, serve and obey him. This is most certainly true. In this summary, the Catechism sets forth the divine providence. With the lists of its gifts, it points out the great love with which God loves us each and every single day. I would call your attention that he does this only out of fatherly divine goodness and mercy, without any merit or worthiness in me. You and I do not earn these great blessings from God. He is not obligated to give them to us. As we heard in the word of God last Sunday, who has given to him that he should pay us back? Therefore, the fact that you and I receive all of these things on a daily basis for all of the years of our lives indicates the great love with which God loves us. This is the love that we have come to know. This is the love we have come to believe. And then there's more. The meaning to the second article of the Apostles' Creed goes like this. I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord, who has redeemed me, a lost and condemned person, purchased and won me from all sins, from death, and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood, and with his innocent suffering and death, that I may be his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. Just as he is risen from the dead, lives and reigns to all eternity, this is most certainly true. It is eight days after the celebration of the festival of the Holy Trinity. No matter how you look at the contents of the second article of the Apostles' Creed, it is the great love with which God has loved us. Look at that from the perspective of the Father. Would any one of us give his child into death to reconcile one's enemies to himself? Would any of us dream of doing such a thing? The great love with which the Father loves us is an unspeakable love. He does precisely that. Our Lord confesses this when he prays in the Garden of Gethsemane. On the evening prior to his death, he prays in the Garden, Father, all things are possible for you. Let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you. When Judas arrives with the crowd to arrest our Lord, to put him on a fake trial, when they subject him to scourging and nail him to a cross, that is the will of God. We have to say it is the will of God because that is what Jesus confesses in his prayer. Not my will, but yours be done. If we do not confess that 
the crucifixion of our Lord is the will of God the Father, then we must say that God is somehow weak or impotent and cannot prevent these things. Or we, we must say that God is malicious and cruel and he rejects the prayer of his Son. This is his only begotten Son praying to him. This is the one with whom he is well pleased. And the one with whom he is well pleased prays, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Therefore, it is the will of God that Judas betray him. It is the will of God that the mob arrest him. It is the will of God that he stand a false trial. It is the will of God that they scourge him. It is the will of God that they nail him to the cross. It is the will of God that he bleeds and dies, and he does it for us. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross is the atoning sacrifice that takes away our sins. It reconciles us to God. God wants his enemies to live with him forever so badly that he will commit his own son to death in order to achieve it. This is the great love with which God has loved us. This is the love we have come to know. This is the love we have believed. Or you could look at the whole thing from the perspective of the son. If you listen to the son, he confesses his own authority over his life. He says, no one has the authority to take my life from me. I have the authority to lay it down, and I have the authority to take it up again. This command I have received from my father. Therefore, it is not Judas and the mob who take the life of the Lord from him. It is not the Pharisees, the chief priests, the scribes, and Pontius Pilate who take his life from him. He is laying down his life of his own accord. We have seen in the Gospels how Jesus could have avoided all of this, but he does not. We can see at his trial how he can testify to his innocence and be relieved. But he does not. In fact, the only testimony Jesus gives at his trial is the testimony which condemns him. Therefore, he fulfills his own words. I lay down my life of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. He lays down his life for us. It is an atoning sacrifice that takes away our sin. For whom would you give your life? For whom would you lay down your life? If it were not a family member, for whom would you lay down your life? Well, he better be a thumbing good person. If it's not going to be my spouse or my children or my parents, if I'm going to lay down my life, it better be worth it. God proclaims this in his own Bible. Somebody might possibly dare to die for a good man, but God shows his own love for us in this, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If Christ died for us while we were still sinners, then the only possible reason he could offer his life into death to atone for our sin is because he loves us. <clears throat> Greater love has no one than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. This truth Jesus declares is so obvious that even some of the unbelievers can quote it. Even they know that. Therefore, you and I are his friends. He has laid down his life for us. He loves you with an everlasting love. This is the great love with which God loves us. This is the love that we have come to know. This is the love in which we have believed. If one abides in God, one abides in love. The actions of God demonstrate beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is love. So often today we define love in terms of our desires. We define love in terms of our neighbor's desires. God has already offered you a definition of love. It is himself. God is love. 
And the one who abides in God abides in love, and God abides in him. And when you abide in God, and God abides in you, and the love of God abides in you, then it casts out fear. About what fear is God speaking in 1 John chapter 4? He is speaking about the fear of judgment. He's talking about the fear of when Jesus returns on the final day. He is talking about the fear of punishment. When our Lord Jesus Christ ascended into heaven, a cloud hid him from the sight of the apostles. The apostles stood there staring into heaven until finally some angels said, Why are you guys staring into heaven? This same Jesus that you have seen go into heaven will in the same way return from heaven. If Jesus can ascend into heaven, he can return from it. If Jesus can rise from the dead, he can come in glory. Therefore, Jesus has promised to return again on the final day. He has promised to return again in glory. He has promised to return with the glory of his Father. He will come riding on the cross. All of the holy angels will accompany him. He will come with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God. The trumpet call of God does what trumpet calls have done since the book of Numbers. They gather God's people together. Those who are in their tombs will hear his voice and they will come out. The living and the dead will stand before the throne of his glory. He will sit upon his glorious throne. He will separate the nations one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. To those on his right, he will say, Welcome, you who are blessed by, by my Father, into the everlasting inheritance prepared for you from before the foundation of the world. And he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you evildoers, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So there are people who go to the eternal fire. There are people in hell who, like the rich man in the parable, cry out to Father Abraham for some kind of relief. And if you can't believe me, at least believe my brothers. And Abraham refers them to the Holy Scriptures, to Moses and the prophets. And the Holy Scriptures consistently predict this kind of return of our Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> even if we say to the hills, fall on us, even if we say to the mountains, cover us, he will still raise us from the dead, and we will stand before him. He is inescapable. There is no place to hide. The fear about which 1 John chapter 4 is speaking is the fear of that great day. It is the fear of the return of Jesus in glory. It is the fear of him sitting on his glorious throne. It is the fear of knowing what will he do to me. Will he welcome me, O thou good and faithful servant? Or will he bid me depart and tell me he never knew me? This is the fear about which 1 John chapter 4 is speaking. This is the fear that perfect love casts out. Perfect love casts out this fear because the perfect love about which 1 John chapter 4 is speaking is the great love with which the Father has loved you. If he has loved you so much that he has given his son into death to take away all of your sins and reconcile you to himself, that you have no fear of his coming judgment. You are already righteous. There is no need to wonder at what Jesus is going to do with the likes of you on the final day. He has already told you what he's going to do in the great love with which he has loved you. This great love stands in the apostolic testimony. It stands in the New Testament. This great love stands as witnessed to in the New Testament of his body and his blood. I forgive you. Here is my body. Here is my blood. This is the great love with which he loves you and he casts out the fear of the final day because fear has to do 
with punishment. If God has forgiven you of all of your sins, then there is no punishment. If there is no punishment, you may stand with confidence before him when he comes. That is why in the book of Hebrews, the apostle testifies that he is coming for those who are eagerly waiting for him. It's not just the confidence of which 1 John chapter 4 speaks. It's the eager longing of the return of the Lord of which Hebrews speaks. Oh, come, Lord Jesus, come. Because if you are afraid, then love has not been perfected in you. Because love has to do with punishment. But the one who abides in God and God abides in him abides in love. And when you abide in love, you abide in the love of God. And when you abide in the love of God, it casts out all fear. You may stand before him in confidence. Then 1 John says it rather starkly. We love because he first loved us. We love because he first loved us. We have come to know and have believed in the great love with which God has loved us. If we have come to know and believe in the great love with which God loves us, then we love the brothers. First John chapter 4 is very specific. It speaks about the brothers. If we're going to understand the message that God is giving us in 1 John chapter 4, we must know who the brothers are. The brothers in the epistle of 1 John are those who have heard the apostolic message and believed it. The apostles testify that they have seen God's glory, they have touched God's glory, they have felt his glory, they have heard his glory, they testify about that glory to you so that you may believe it and your fellowship may be with the Father the Son. The apostolic testimony is in the New Testament. It testifies about the glory of God. It testifies about the great love with which God has loved us. We have believed in that. And because we believe the apostles, we are in fellowship with the apostles. And if we're in fellowship with the apostles, we are in fellowship with the Father and the Son. So the brothers are anybody who has fellowship with the Father and the Son. It is anybody who believes the testimony of the apostles. It is anybody who believes the great love with which God has loved us. In both biblical language and in our own language, we use the term brother in a narrow way and in a broad way. In the narrow way, it means a male sibling. That's my brother. But in a broad way, it means anybody who is a member of the same community of which I am a member. Whether man or woman makes no difference, they are all brothers. The community about which 1 John chapter 4 is speaking is the community of those who believe in the great love with which God has loved us. We are in fellowship with the apostles and therefore in fellowship with the Father and with the Son. A brother is anybody else who shares in that same fellowship. <clears throat> Matthew's Gospel describes it in a slightly different way. After our Lord rises from the dead, our Lord commands his apostles, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and I am with you always, even to the conclusion of the age. Matthew basically says the same thing that 1 John says when he says, Teach the nations everything that I have commanded. The apostles went out and taught the nations everything that Jesus had commanded. It is recorded for us in the New Testament. Those of us who believe it are in fellowship with the Father and with the Son. The only thing Matthew adds is baptism. Baptism into the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. There was a crowd around Jesus one day, and they said to him, Hey, 
your mother and your brothers want to see outside. And Jesus said, who are my mother and my brothers? And then he pointed to his disciples. And he said, these who do the will of my Father in heaven, they are my mother and my sister and my brother. Jesus exalts his disciples above blood relation. The name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is more important than any surname. It is more important than any righteous and popular name. It is the name above all names, and it is the name by which the family of the community of believers is known. Therefore, the baptized are the brothers. The baptized are the brothers that we love, and we love them because God has loved us. We do not love, and then God loves us. God loves us, and then we love. And who is it that we love? We love the brothers. That's who we love. We love the people we go to church with. We love the people baptized in the same name we are. We love the people with whom we sing hymns together for the divine service. We love the people who stand and confess the same creed that we confess. We love the people with whom we eat Christ's body and blood. Those are the brothers. It is not given to us to debate one another's faith. I cannot look at you and judge your faith. Neither can you look at one another and judge one another's faith. Such that you would say, you know, I don't think he's a believer, so you know what, I'm not going to love him. God places us into the community of the baptized. He places us into a divine service. He places us in front of a common sacrament. Those are the brothers. Because those are the people that we can see. And those are the ones that God commands us to love with the same love 